Hey everyone, you're listening to the Simple Electronics Podcast. I'm your host, Dan, from the Simple Electronics YouTube channel. And this episode is brought to you by PCBWay. A little bit more about them a little later on, because I've got a very special guest on, Dustin Watts. How are you, Dustin? Welcome. Thanks. I am great, actually. Well, good. Great is just a bit too much, but I'm, <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, great. You know, I, I think if you're, you're great doesn't exist, in my opinion. Well, yeah, great. When it, when it comes to a person. For sure. You, the, you can't be, yeah, you can't be great. The human experience but I'm isn't good. great. But that, that's that's good to know that you're good. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. Thanks. How are you? I am, I'm well. Um, hurt my back a little bit last week. I'm still on the mend and right. I lost my voice last week. Or, no, sorry. I hurt my back four weeks ago, but it was still hurting last week. And so I'm on the mend from both of those. So yeah, here's hoping. Well, um, I don't hear any difference. I listen to your podcast. Uh, usually when I'm, uh, I'm just tinkering, uh, put on a podcast, uh, and uh, usually it's the uh, Simple Electronics podcast. So uh, when we had a bit of contact before, you said you were honored, but no, it's the other way around. I'm I'm honored. Honestly, for this podcast, one of the greatest honors is hearing people who do cool stuff, um, hearing that you you folks put on the podcast while you're working on your cool stuff. Like I have a robotics engineer uh, that was also a guest, Aisha. And she said mm-hmm. she listens to the podcast while she does her work. And uh, and literally her work is like uh, programming and and uh, designing robots that go and pick strawberries when they're, when they're ripe, but leave them if they're not ripe. Oh, right. And so like things like that is probably the greatest honor a podcaster could have is to be you know, shoulder to shoulder, to shoulder with people who make really cool stuff. And I include cool. you in this because um, many people might know you from your YouTube channel, but I think what's even more impressive is your um, your free touch deck project and your ESP32 touchdown uh, project. Can you talk to us a little bit about those two things? Yeah, I can, sure. Um, it started about four years ago now. It was I was watching a, uh, a video by Adam Welsh, um, who is in my list of subscribers, uh, subscriptions. I'm subscribed to him. Uh, I hope the other way around. And um, he was making a free deck, which was those OLED screens with a, a, just a, a tactile switch underneath. And... For some reason, I thought, well, that could be done with a touchscreen. Uh, the only thing is that it was very difficult to um, to program. I'm not a programmer. I can make simple Arduino things, but this was way over my head, I realized very soon. But I wanted to finish it. It's it's how my project goes, uh, usually go. I start something and then I want to finish it just to, well, just to show myself I can do it. And um, I did it. I made an instructable. And then I thought, well, this is all like, a bit of you need a PCB or you, you need to just solve some wires and you can make it. And then I thought, well, let's start uh, by making the, the whole thing in one PCB with screen and all and capacitive touch in, and not uh, resistive touch. So that's how that started. And I made a few like 25 and they were gone like in a, in in a day, and I, I was kind of shocked. I didn't expect that. And, uh, I've been selling them for four years, of course. Well, three and a half. And I sold over five five hundred, five hundred and fifty of them, and it, it's just crazy. 
Well, it's crazy because it's so good. Be- like I, I've been good. sort of thinking about uh, this kind of project for a very long time, and for first of all, it saddens me to say that this has been four years because I remember it like it was yesterday. I think the last four years kind of flew right by me, but I've been sort of thinking of like macro pads and stuff like that just just to replace the Elgato Stream Deck because the Elgato Stream Deck if people don't know is like this box you put beside your computer it's plugged in by USB and there's buttons mm-hmm. on it and the buttons have images and those images are all like on screen so the buttons are the screens and these things are quite expensive if I'm looking on the US Amazon it's anywhere between 175 150 ish dollars for one of these and i thought yeah it can't be that complicated so i was going to do something similar but with just like push buttons and static images but i think the way you approached it is is brilliant because you can recreate the fact that the buttons are you know, um, screens by just using one big screen and using a graphics library or however you do it to make the buttons on the touch screen. So I think that was a stroke of genius on, on your behalf. Ah, oh, thank you very much. I, I don't consider, uh, consider myself a, a genius, whatever it's for me. It's, I, I thought, well, if you use a touch screen, um, you can display whatever you want and have those images. Uh, it doesn't have to be like 120, 150, 100 and up. Uh, I can do this for way less. And yeah, I could do it for $20. And it, it's the same experience. The thing is that uh, if you have the, the, the stream deck, uh, they have well contracts with uh, certain software uh, where they could just break in or just have an uh, API just for them and this is basically just a keyboard um, but you can you know have a complicated shortcut to do whatever uh, yeah, you can just just do that with one button, and that's what a, a, a macro keyboard does. I just thought, well, why not make it look good and not just be like a, a, an an extra numpad on the side of your computer? So let's move a little bit further back for the uh, for for the people who who haven't heard of the ESP32 touchdown and the sure. free touch deck. So can you tell me the difference? Like what is a free touch deck and what is an ESP32 touchdown? Uh, the free touch deck or free touch deck is the software and the ESP32 touchdown is the hardware. That's the difference. But the software, if I'm not mistaken, is just, it's kind of, open right like you can use an esp32 with a uh, compatible touchscreen and combine it on breadboard and use esp32 touchdown software right oh no sorry yeah, esp per- thir- free touch deck software <laughs> yeah correct yeah it's a uh, totally open source and i use the esp because it has a web interface and it's running a web server and a configurator, a uh, configurator, and you can basically configure what every button does if you're logged into the configurator and restart and button changes. So nothing is hard coded. So who coded the the uh, free touch deck? Because you said you're not a, a programmer, but I used the software a little bit and. It was incredibly easy to use. And like in my industry, in the automotive industry, 
all mm-hmm. of our like dealership management stuff is made by software companies and their software runs like garbage when yours runs really well. So if you're not a programmer, who programmed it? I did. Well, there we go. I think you're a programmer yeah. then. <laughs> but hey, it took me uh, a really long time and uh, I borrowed codes from other open source projects. Uh, but in the end, yeah, it was just me. Not anymore. Um, for the new version, uh, we're going all out and we have a, a development team. But uh, the first version, uh, yeah, th- that was just me. So it was just, uh, for those listening, it was like a web interface that, that you, it looked like a, like very much like a HTML, PHP type thing. And it was essentially you just select your your buttons. You can put in images. Uh, you can put in the like what it does. And there was different layers to it. Like honestly, it was very usable software, and it certainly didn't feel like it should be free. So that's just my opinion. It felt like it was a developed product. So that was really nice. But you know, again, when you say four years ago. That makes me sad because I haven't played with this software probably for for those couple of years now. So I need to go and and check out how it works now because it's probably improved since then. There are some uh, bug fixes. Uh, that's all. It, it's basically still the same, uh, just a little bit better, maybe. Um, version 2 is going to be a lot better, but... Um, that's a bit because what you're talking about is the HTML side of things and that's where I just I'm really basic Uh, I I didn't use a framework or whatever I just used plain HTML in a file of about 4000 lines and and now I have some people who are actually uh, web programmers. Yeah, together we're making it uh, great. Uh, drag and drop and all those things. That, that's all coming. But um, the problem is is that I invest. Uh, the investments are mine. So I have to sell a few, invest. Uh, set a few more and then grow like that and so the next version which I have here uh, uh, the hardware version is 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 done it just have to make it and make a lot of them and although s- and we need to sell a lot of them for you yeah well Unless I use something like Crowd Supply or Kickstarter, which I'm planning to do, because China came and uh, my my uh, so the ESP32 Touchdown the hardware the the hardware thing was copied a lot by any Chinese Chinese manufacturer you can think of, and uh, they can make thousands in a jiffy and that made my product very expensive although I don't make a lot I think I make about six seven euros on each uh, free touch deck I uh, sorry uh, USB 32 I sell and the software is of course open source so that's free so let's talk a little bit about the hardware. And I, I want to talk about the current revision. And then afterwards, we can go talk about what's new in the new revision. So this sure. is not just like I've designed a combiner PCB essentially to mount uh, my style of ESP32 that I have in stock here to a TFT. And that'll run the uh, free touch deck software. But your ESP32 touchdown is much more than that. Can can you talk about the features that you added onto your um, onto your project? Sure. Um, well, I started with a combiner board. That was the simple version. Uh, you could uh, just wire it all up. But uh, because you're working with 
uh, with the screen, uh, just a, a slightly bad connection for a, a few milliseconds. To, uh, even a millisecond will screw up your whole experience. So I started with that. I wanted the same screen, but then just the screen and not the uh, PCB it's on. And then I started thinking, well, I have all this real estate um, because, well, I couldn't make it smaller than the, the screen. What can I put on that makes sense? And, of course, the ESP32 is on there. And then there's the uh, SD card reader. Uh, there's a, a stemma connector. There's, uh, what you call it, a buzzer on it. All the pins that are not used are broken out. Um, there's battery management, so you can run it off a battery. It works over BLE using the ESP32. Um, what more features? Um, battery management. Also, there's the battery the, connector on it. Yeah, there's. Yeah, it's a it's a JST uh, connector. It has. Hey, yeah, it has USB C as well. Yeah, yeah. You can't you can't make anything now these days without USB C. I I would be uh, very mad. Don't take I it for been... granted. I've I've bought um, <laughs> like I was sent a uh, a quite expensive uh, microscope and it still had uh, micro USB on it. Unimaginable. <laughs> I know it, it doesn't make any difference in the cost. Uh, a USB-C connector, the same. You don't have it. Well, if you just want five volts, which which you probably want, it will cost you two resistors. That's it. Yeah, but I think for for the microscope, there's no there's no reason. But for like stuff that's manufactured in probably you know tens of millions, then yeah, I I can sort of understand. But these days, I, I don't know. I I would rather that they charge me, you know, a hundred X what it costs extra, which is probably a cent, you know, make it a dollar more. And, and I want USB-C. I don't think it would be a dollar. It's, it's literally uh, the same, the same price, maybe uh, a cent. Um, if you buy a hundred, it's a cent more. So I don't see any reason not to use USB C. And also uh, to be clear, this is like your your ESP thirty two touchdown is essentially a PCB which is slightly bigger than the than the, the screen itself and it has four mounting holes and you but also the community have designed cases for them too so they sit nicely on your desk, correct? Yeah. I uh designed in Fusion, uh, a simple case for them, uh, for it. And people uh, in the community, in my Discord, uh, started designing their own cases and uh, put them up on Thingiverse and other uh, 3D sharing sites. And yeah, I, I really like that. That that was, for me, the greatest greatest compliment, that people... But well, this is a great piece of hardware. Uh, but I like my case in a different way, and everything's available. So if you have the the diffusion file, is available, so you can just easily modify it if you like. I'm trying to do everything open source, uh, but of course for the ESP uh, 3G touchdown, I have no other choice than to ask some money. But the rest is all open source. And the source files you can just simply download from my GitHub. So the ESP32 touchdown, so that's the hardware that you designed, uh -huh. that one is not open source, but everything else around it is open source, correct? I'm sorry, the the, the, the board itself is open source. So there, if you okay. would like to uh, discard a few things and add your own, you're free to do that. There we go. So that's what I thought too. So I was a little surprised when you said that, um, that like, obviously 
for an assembled product, uh, it makes a lot of sense to to pay and pay a premium. I would say your like I'm, I just clicked through your your links on your uh, ESP32 touchdown.com um. and then it says where to buy and I just clicked on PCB way, which is a sponsor of this uh, this channel in this episode. And I see here that you, that the I believe it's the assembled product is 58 US dollars, which I feel like is an incredible value for what you get because it is beautifully designed. It looks really good too when you get it, and um, it's like professionally assembled. I, I don't think it's there, there's hand solder anywhere on that. I think it's it's all manufactured. It looks great. Yeah, it, it it's all uh, it's uh, I I could squeeze it on a two layer board, so I went with two layer board, and it's uh, assembled by your sponsor. <laughs> So we have a sponsor in common. Yeah, it's it's all uh, all SMD because on the other side the screen had, had to uh, the screen had to be mounted on the other side, so there couldn't be any components there. Um, uh, so also through hole was not an option anymore because of shorts and things, um, and they assembled it. Uh, and they made the PCB, and they also sell it. So if someone is listening to the podcast right now, and they want to get their hands on a free touch deck, how would you recommend they go about it? What's, what's, the, what's the way you prefer to sell them? Well, the problem is, is that it's uh, almost everywhere it's sold out. Um, I have a few left. So I would say join my Discord or just go to my YouTube channel and there's a link to my Discord and uh, just contact me directly and uh, we'll figure something out because the price on the on PCB way that's PCB way on Tindy uh, it was uh, 52 at the end so yeah if you trust me then you just PayPal me 52 plus shipping and I will send you one. There we go. So there's going to be a rush that, on those for sure. Well, there are, I think, seven, eight left. I don't know. That's it. And then I'm done. And uh, then all my folks will be on the version two, which I hope to release uh, as soon as possible. So let's talk about the version two then. So... I think the uh, version one is quite impressive. So what have you done to version two uh, to make it better? Uh, the first thing I did is use the ESP S32S3, uh, which is uh, way better than the ESP32. Uh, the screen is now driven uh, in 8-bit parallel instead of SPI, which makes it really fast. Um, because of the larger space I have for uh, for the uh, for the software, uh, the configurator is going to be much better. There's now also a development team uh, working on it, and it's going to be all drag and drop. Um, it, it's way more simple. You can, if you want, just do free text. And let's say you have a, a text box where you can put in some text. You could literally put in text and then put in brackets, uh, shift, control, K, and then go on typing. That's a new thing. Uh, but the, the what I have experienced myself is that the screen running that in eight bit parallel is is so much more. I don't know how, how to, to like it's more responsive, to, to, maybe. Uh, way more, yeah. It it is. Uh, it loads very quick compared to the uh, SPI. So it's like just 
a normal screen, I don't know, I, the experience is like working on a desktop almost. Oh, wow. And so is this going to come with uh, extra cost? Because uh, it seems like you said you had a team. The ESP32 S3 is uh, more expensive. Um, you know, hardware has gotten more expensive over the years. Is there going to be an extra cost involved in, in this one, you think? I hope not. If I can keep the cost down, um, I, I will. Because I'm still doing this for fun. It's not my job. Um, I don't have a company. So why why would I? It, it, it helps making videos because it can, can make more, more postbacks. But that's it. There's a little bit of manual labor because I am the one at the end... Uh, putting the screen on and of course packing it and shipping it but no I'm not out for money it's you said it's 58 at PCB way um, on Tindy it was 52 version 1 I think it will be about the same people are calling me crazy but I've, I've talked to Ceylon now uh, the unexpected maker I'm sorry how he did it and uh, he, he said, the prices you are asking, you're, you're crazy. Um, I think I, I'm not crazy. Uh, I have myself tested. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I'm doing this for to show that even if you're just someone like me who is an electronic enthusiast, you can still make other people happy. And um, that's all I want. Just a quick interruption to talk about this episode's sponsor, PCBWay. PCBWay has been a long-term sponsor of the channel, and I think they're a good match for my channel because they provide quality PCBs for a reasonable price. You can get boards manufactured up to 100 mils by 100 mils for just $5, including shipping to Canada, 15 US dollars, including shipping to USA, 12 US dollars, which is incredibly cheap for professionally manufactured PCBs. I can personally attest to the quality of these PCBs, and so if you want a circuit immortalized forever, check out PCBWay.com with the link in the description. Now back to the conversation. So I will say, I do understand what you're saying, but please also consider that working on this project does take, you know, a toll. It's not... It, like it's not free to produce like mentally you've got some strain involved and don't forget that people are going to want support which you've been offering again for free in your discord um uh -huh. so i i mean i would <laughs> encourage you to build in a little bit more of a profit margin and i believe that the community will happily pay a little bit more um because they want the project to to keep going. They want the the, the project to survive. And for those uh, who can't afford to pay, let's say, I'm just shooting out a number here, but let's say they can't afford to pay the, you know, the ten dollar premium on top of that. Let's say sixty two. So that's not even that much extra money. Uh, the project is fully open source, anyways. So people can you know just use your software and design their own boards or I'm sure someone in the community will will design a cut down version or or something like that I would you know I would strongly recommend you you at least consider putting a little bit more profit so that the the project is sustainable uh, you know even if you want to call it this way maybe you, you know maybe consider it an investment in a possible version three you know, like even if you put that money aside so that you have a little bit more development overhead or you can afford to, you know, hire someone to do parts of it or you can, you can, you know, send some, uh, some, some relief to your, to your team. But I, I believe, you know, in the hardware game, what Sion says should 
stick because Sion is quite successful. Uh, Sion is the unexpected he is. maker. Yeah, he is. So um, if he says you should be asking more, I would be inclined to believe him. And, I, and I'm thinking about that. Yeah. Um, for me, there's no real strain. I've done it uh, up until now with, with, with pleasure. Of course, there's some things that if you repeat them over and over and over again, uh, yet you can feel that mentally and physically. But still, I am. I, I'm totally honest. Uh, I, I make about eight, seven, eight dollars per sold unit. So I think that's fair enough. Uh, I, I, I'm just not sure. And I will listen to what people say and I will take that into account. And what you said, uh, if people are willing to spend, um, well, if you take the PCB way price 58, yeah, they will also pay 62, which uh, is, a, is, a, is a, it's a good investment in the version 3. I agree with with you on that. Yeah. Yeah. And like, just put it this way. When, I I don't know what grocery prices have been like around your area, but in my area, um, grocery prices have, you know, gone up like 50% since the pandemic and grocery stores have been getting record profits and, you know, food is a necessity and they don't mind uh, taking a massive profit off of people needing to eat. I think that a passionate uh, Dutch fellow who made a fantastic project deserves a little piece of the pie too. I'm that's just me thinking out loud here. Ah, uh, no, this is me thanking you very much. Uh, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> so I want to get yeah, a little bit thanks. into the weeds. Um, so what what qualifies you to? to make such a, a cool product like what do you do for a living is it anything related to this no no not at all um it's been a bad electronics and has been a passion since i was six years old and wrecked my mom's it's hi-fi tower but no no education nothing just purely interest and learning via YouTube, other makers, uh, just checking out schematics, uh, using breadboards. That is my qualification. Uh, My uh, profession is a sound engineer, and if you want to go a bit deeper, it's called front of house engineer. That's why I am. And a front of house engineer is the one that stands behind the bit mixing desk they got smaller over time because they got digital uh and mixes for the audience and so you you do this do you work at your own company or do you work for someone else i work for for a few bands and do tours and i get hired so i have my own company it's freelance um work that i do and I get hired by um, by venues who need a front of house engineer because the band didn't bring their own. That still happens because it's it's expensive. It's it well it it's what the audience hears, so it's it's very important. But usually, the last thing they think about. They rather pay, uh, uh, they take their cabinets, you know, if it's an electric guitar from a 212, 2 by 2, uh, 212 to a 412, because that is, uh, that will make them sound better, but no. And I'm not, I'm, yeah, it, it, it does, yeah, sure, it does. Uh, but you can, make them yourself um, and uh, just use two speakers it was the, the sounds the same 
Um, it's just it looks cooler. Yeah, you look like uh, Metallica. That, that that's what you get from it, but it doesn't make you sound like Metallica. I've heard at uh, some large concerts that they have like these massive stacks of amps uh, behind the the bands. I've heard that a uh, lot of those amps aren't even plugged in; they're just there for show. What, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, that's uh, that that's true. There's uh, there's this wall of of, of cabinets, um, and one is mic'd, and the rest is not even on. <laughs> that they don't even have the speakers in them; it's just the outside. All right. All right, here's here's another one I've heard, and you can tell me if it's true or not. I've heard sure. that for indoor venues, you have to yeah. adjust the bass as the venue fills up and then empties out because the, the bass tones will sound different in a full room versus an empty room. Is that true? That's absolutely true. And not only the bass, everything sounds different. Um, so if you sound check in an empty room... Uh, and then the public fills the room and they start uh, playing. Yeah, you basically have to tweak a lot of things, everything from vocals to drums to, yeah. That basically, you're bringing in a big cushion. Yeah, um, big meat bags full yeah. of water. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're all little cushions and everything dampens and you have to uh, adjust uh, but usually you can do that during the first half of the song because during the sound check, uh, if you do it right, uh, you account for that. All right, one more, one more. Um, I hear yeah. that the drummer is always late. Is that true? <laughs> it's no, it's not true. Oh. It's I. Uh, yeah, usually they all show up at the same time. And, uh, people pick on the drummer, but it's it's uh, uh, no, it, that's that's not true. Damn, that was uh, that that was close. We we got two for three on on what I yeah. believed versus what is real. Yeah, in fact, this 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 maybe is funny. Um, even if he was late. We all had to wait uh, because the first thing you start with uh, in a sound check is the kick. So you start with the drummer, and the first thing you start with is the kick drum. And then you go snare, hi hat, and the rest of the drum kit. Um, so you start with the drummer with the sound check. So if he would be late, everything, everybody would have to wait and I think that's where the uh, the joke comes from that because uh, we all have to wait to start our sound check is because the drummer's late and he's first but no gotcha no. so usually they come they all come in a van and they'll come at the same time with their uh, with their kits uh, with their amps, with their whatever the drummer brings, and they all come together. But that's, uh, you know what I mean. Yeah, that's the more boring answer, but it's probably the true one. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, it, it would be funny if that were true. Uh, it, it would explain why everyone's always late, but if the drummer's late... Uh, the rest of them are late, though. Is there any, like, overlap between your electronics uh, hobby and your professional career? Like, immediately when I think an electronics enthusiast doing sound stuff, I immediately think of, like, someone who's built their own, you know, preamps or, or stuff like that. Is that is any yeah. of that relevant to you? Yes, Absolutely. I haven't made a video in a long time, and uh, the first video is going to be exactly that, my own preamp, mic preamp. Ooh, yeah. very nice. So this is uh, yes. 
your own design from the ground up or is this uh, based on someone's circuit that you modified or, or what is it? Uh, it's both. I am not uh, a Rupert Neve who just designs his own preamps because Neve designs are very popular, Neve preamps. Um, but I... I, I, well, sometimes I show up at a venue where there's, and this is for theater. I also work in theater, in theater, where there's just a crappy mixer with no control whatsoever. Yeah, that's a bit of high, high and mid tones and things, but that's it. So I'm designing now a two channel, channel strip, which is a preamp. A compressor, audio compressor, an equalizer, and then just uh, an output to make things, uh, well, the level you want. And that's going to be my next project with a separate power supply uh, with 48 volts for uh, a dynamic microphone. Uh, yeah, dyna- sorry, condenser microphones. Yeah, phantom power, right? Phantom power, yeah, forty-eight volts, phantom power. Yeah, I'm just looking at my mixer right here to to my to my right, so that's why I'm able to pull it up easier. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you have a um, a dynamic microphone, you don't need that. Um, if you have a condenser, a large diaphragm, or big diaphragm, you need forty-eight volts for phantom power just to charge the plates that are in your capsule. So what what does uh, like building a preamp like that, what's that cost component wise? Like just straight components. Do you, is that something like 10 bucks, 20 bucks, 100 bucks? It depends. Um, if you go with with the, the, the best of the best, yeah, you, you, you'll be spending 100 bucks. If you go for just a normal clean sound, which is what I want, maybe twenty, thirty dollars. Depends if you use transformer as an input or not, uh, or transformer as an output or not. Um, so cost wise, it doesn't have to break the bank. And like someone like you who self describes as you know not a uh, like like an electronics engineer or anything like that, is there like is it possible? for someone like you and I to design a PCB that's meant for audio but still have very clean sound because I I think there's some considerations you have to do when you want to build a PCB for sound because there's a lot of potential for interference, right? Yeah, but it is possible. Uh, The the interference uh, usually comes from the outside, so if you have a nice Faraday cage um that will mitigate a lot of the noise but every component uh, makes noise even just a resistor so if you build something and you have a lot of resistors they add noise but i'm using a dedicated chip for that um and that is a very quiet chip and that is well gain wise it will give you about 60 db so that means you can go from uh, 10 millivolts to line level uh, professional line level which is uh, 1.2 rms and what's the um what's the chip you're using or is that a secret until the video is out no of, co- of course not a secret i have no I will have some secrets, but not a lot. It's uh, uh, that. So that's the chip. That's uh, 1512. That's the chip I'm using. Okay. And I, I, it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, no. it's a, it's a, yeah. It's just like a preamp chip? It is half of it. You have to do some, well, you have to place some components in, in the input. Um, but it will, I don't know if you ever heard of balanced and unbalanced. Um, this is, uh, a chip that does the balancing, uh, or the debalancing actually, because you don't need it to be balanced 
anymore uh, for you. So you don't have to do that yourself. That takes away transistor matching and all that sort of things. Yeah, so I've heard the terms, but I, I wasn't quite sure what it meant. But I'm, I'm just looking up the uh, chip real quick here, and it looks like it's $10 Canadian in one-off uh, quantities and, and sort of like eight fifty Canadian in 10 quantities. So very reasonable price, and you, I'm guessing you need two of those. If you have a two-channel, uh, yeah, for each microphone you need one. So And I'm planning on a, a two-channel, so I need two of them. Um, but you also need a a plus and minus DC voltage. So you need a special, well, not a special, but you need a power supply which can supply plus and minus 15 volts. So just a chip doesn't get you there. Um, you need to design or make or buy whatever, uh, some other things that will make it work. And are you rolling your own power supply onto this uh, project, or are you just going with uh, l like a sort, sort of like a black box, like a potted power supply? So I found a schematic online, and you could download the Gerbers, and I had a mate, and that's one of the things I'm going to make a video about, just building it. Um, soldering together and telling why certain things work the, the way they do. That's so. That's really neat, actually. I've been um, I've been trying to understand op amps for quite a long time, uh, like component level op amps. And um, mm -hmm. recently, in an episode of the podcast, I went and answered some beginner questions on Reddit, and one of them was just asking for like what kind of projects are, are good for beginners to to sort of uh, do to get their cut their teeth and one thing I recommended was a was like a, a, an amplifier because a simple amplifier mm -hmm. you can build on a breadboard and it's not going to sound fantastic but but you know it, it does work and um, I've got some uh, PCBs here from uh, that was designed by a fellow YouTuber uh, I keep forgetting his name, but I, he was a, a guest on the podcast. Uh, and so I've actually played with PCBs, uh, with those PCBs. And the base, you know, the base functions of a, uh, of, of an amplifier are actually starting to demystify for me. So I've been getting the bug, you know, to build my own sort of like, cheap guitar amp and so your video is going to uh -huh. be is going to be fantastic i'm looking forward to that so so yeah i'm i'm really excited for that i'm glad to hear you're working on that well it it, it it's a lot simpler than you think there's the op amp which is well it does what it says what it does it amplifies but there are people who are building their own op amp from scratch because an op amp is made out of a lot of transistors and resistors, diodes, uh, like capacitors. It's all made out of, out of discrete components plus transistors. And in the DIY community, there are people who are building their own op amps. They sound amazing. They're usually used in, in preamps. And... Understanding it is not that difficult, but you have to, you know, your brain have, has to have a little, a little change. It's not simply making things louder. That that usually doesn't work for a microphone preamp because if you make things louder, you make the noise, whatever noise, you also make it louder. So there are some things you have to do to amplify the sound you want uh, without amplifying the sound, uh, the the noise that comes with it. And that's why you need to apply filters typically before amplification, correct? Yes. And that's why when you work in audio, you have to balance audio, which is, uh, it. it's like a, uh, like a USB line. You have to post it. 
positive and a negative. And they're basically a, a, a copy 180 degrees out of phase. And when you apply some magic, which is not magic, the noise goes away. It's a differential pair. That, that's, that's the difference between balanced and unbalanced. Oh, gotcha. Um, but before you do something with it, you have to unbalance it again and only work with a uh, unbalanced line because otherwise you had to, uh, would have to do everything twice. You'd have to sort of, uh, so whatever you apply to the positive side would have to be applied to the negative side, essentially. You'd have to apply your effects Cor to both, uh, you know, both of the pairs. Yeah, correctly. And that would be, well, twice as expensive, but also pretty much impossible. You can do uh, something to one line, if we call it a line, exactly to the other line. That that's t it, It's impossible. And then at the end, that will cancel each other out or uh, will do the opposite and... Uh, double something uh, so that's why you work with uh, an unbalanced signal until it goes out of the box again uh, you rebalance it just to stop interference yeah. Yeah. on literally on between the cable and the amplifier essentially or cable and the speaker Ex exactly that's why uh, guitar because um, these are unbalanced guitar uh, uh, lines uh, that's why you try to keep them as short as possible because you you have an unbalanced line between your guitar and your amp so essentially when they when they're on stage when a musician's on stage and they have the wireless transmitter do you think mm -hmm. aside from the compression that the transmitter adds do you think that's essentially the the cleanest way to get audio because the transmitter is sitting essentially right on the guitar or right on the strap yeah yeah, that that that's that's uh, that's absolutely true. The, the the problem is is that to get a good sound wirelessly uh, will cost you uh, a, a cheap one. Will do its 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 work. It's what it's made for, but it doesn't sound right because well, even that little short distance between the guitar and the the transmitter is very important because it has to transmit everything the way the guitar puts it out and that will cost you so all the electronics that go into a, a preamp for example the better they are the cleaner sound uh, so that will of course race whatever they cost so are we talking essentially like high cost in like for those transmitters are you talking about high cost in like the adc because you you need a very high fidelity very quick adc and then you know obviously then it has to transmit exactly what the adc has uh read and then you have to decode it on the other end you have to do all of this like within a millisecond is, is that the issue is that the adc uh, has to be very expensive, and so does the sort of the, like the transmitting features. They need to be high bandwidth. Yeah, of course. We're talking about well, if if you, if you have like eighty hertz, that those are not the problem frequencies. The fifteen kilohertz, yeah, they have to be transmitted in the same fidelity as the lower frequencies. And that's where the costs go, because that's pretty difficult to do in short, short, short amounts of time. And we're not talking about milliseconds anymore. We're talking about nanoseconds. Yeah, very true. So we're getting to a, the point of the podcast where it's uh, it's time to ask you the question that I ask most my podcast guests. Are you ready for it? Yeah, I am. All right. So. You get a large grant to start the company of your dreams. 
the company uh, oh, no. does not have to be profitable because you're getting topped up, but it does have to provide a service or a product. What kind of company would you open? I would open a company that will uh, that would teach electronics on a basic level to to kids in, in their younger ages. Um, in the Netherlands, we we just started teaching people that are or kids that are like four or five English. I think that is amazing. I would add electronics to that because we we are already living in a world without we, where we couldn't live without electronics and it's it that's only gonna that that that's gonna change so much that there's gonna be a point where we can't live without I can't live without it now imagine when my kids get older so that's uh that's where I would be there seems to be quite a a movement amongst YouTubers. Now, I YouTubers are a self-selected sort of group for me because that's the group I interact with the most. But often when I ask this question, it always comes down to like educating and sort of uh, sharing knowledge and, and stuff like that. Um, when you started your YouTube channel, do you think that the idea of uh, sharing the knowledge that you had to, you know, look up yourself in order to get started in electronics, it, was that a, a, a big consideration for you or did you start your YouTube channel for other reasons? Uh, I started my uh, YouTube channel because everything I learned about electronics, I learned from other people doing it on YouTube. And my channel was a way to give something back. So that that's how, how I started it. And I, I think we could do that at a younger age. Oh, I, I totally agree. Um, but I mean, it, it's so... I think that the state of education right now does need a little bit of a revamp because there is a strong focus on sort of like reading, writing skills, like in-depth reading and understanding, mathematics, uh -huh. uh, science. But I, I do agree that there isn't enough sort of like a general education, like uh, being able to take an electronics class or a computer class or a programming class and stuff like that. It's not available to everyone. And I do think that exposing students to, uh, you know, to... To, to the world, like what's available out there is quite important. Uh, we were talking on the pre-show. I just went to a big, uh, like a trade show essentially. And it was mm -hmm. about yeah. ex exposing uh, high school kids. Actually, there was down to like seventh grade as well to um, my profession, which is automotive uh, through my, my college. And so they got to come in, you know, we had uh, fuel injectors uh, firing into a into like a well it's essentially like a run stand but uh fuel injectors firing we had spark plugs firing i had an oscilloscope plugged into both so they can see the injector duration and the um the positioning and the timing of the uh, of the sparks and stuff like that and i think just exposing students to like what it looks like what you know what i see in my profession is already a good thing. And I think we should have maybe one class where they spend like a week doing coding, a week doing electronics, a week doing woodworking or, or something, at least to give them the flavor. And then if they want to continue on, you know, and learning more in those subjects, then at least they know it's a it's a potential. I I think that that's my opinion at, at the very least. Yeah, and I agree. I agree with you. Children nowadays they they have their phone and they can't live without it. Uh, but they just assume I turn it on and I turn on my Snapchat or TikTok or whatever and it works, having no idea the engineering that's behind it. And I think exposing them to a little bit 
the, the simplest things of that part of engineering will greatly enhance the choices they make later in life and the appreciation they have for people that we or I uh, have, have great appreciation for life or, or debt. Um, so I hope uh, that that will come and that the grant isn't necessary anymore but that that's what I would do with it yeah so so as... give me I'll, I'll give me your uh, I'll send you a, a we call it a tiki you, you don't have that do you in uh, in, in Canada I, I can send you a, a, a WhatsApp transaction and you, you just pay with your phone and that's it. Uh, Do you no, have that? No, we have, uh, well, we use uh, e-transfer, essentially. Yeah. Uh, and so it, it's not like the Americans where they use a third party. We just like send money bank to bank, essentially. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we do the same thing. Yeah. In the Netherlands, if I send you, uh, if you have a Dutch a bank, it's immediate. There's no delay. It's it's. I send you the money, and literally uh, half second later, you have the money. Yep. So, um, I, I mean, this is theoretical. I don't have any grants to give you, sadly. <laughs> uh, I will. I'll buy version two of the uh, uh, free touch deck. Uh, sorry, the ESP32 touchdown when it's available. Because you have kindly sent me version one, and um, I did, and I'm I'm just gonna blame you for a second, but I am aware that it's all my fault um, because I was delaying. Why? I was delaying making the video until you had stock of, um, you, you know, of the the version one, and um, then when you did have stock, then I was too busy to make the video, and that's why it's been sitting on the shelf. But lately, yeah, and now, and now I'm not gonna restock. So. I know. This is all been for nothing. <laughs> yeah. But uh, <laughs> what I will do, though, is I, is I will buy the version 2 when it is available. And at some point shortly, uh, and I say shortly with the big asterisk because I have a list of things I have to do, uh, I do want to get the version 1 set up and, and make a video on that because uh, I've been live streaming a lot more, not for the last month or so since I hurt my back, but... I've been live streaming a lot more and, oh. uh, this, the silly thing is I've been talking with my chat that I need some way to control my PC from a distance. And cause my, my work PC is not at my workbench. And, and then when I went looking through my raspberry Pis and stuff, I'm like, Oh yeah, I've got, <laughs> I've got a free, uh, ESP32 touchdown. So it's going to be implemented at some point soon as part of my my setup. So I'm going to make the videos on that and hopefully at least generate a little bit of buzz for your um, version 2 that is forthcoming. I really appreciate that. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's wireless. I know. So you don't have to plug it into your computer to have it. It works via Billy uh, if you have a battery, which is not included because I'm not going to ship a battery. Um, if you have a lipo, or you can use eighteen six fifty fifties as well, if you want to. Let me just rephrase your... that. It's not that you're unwilling to send lithium. Is is that the the issue is that you encourage recycling of uh, of lithium batteries that are just sitting there collecting dust? You should use those for your projects, right? It's not about the shipping. Wink, wink. Ah. <laughs> well, most most of us have. I have a ton of lithium uh, lying around here. Uh, so why include that? No, just let me use the one I have. Exactly. Yeah, I've got eighteen six fifties for days. Yeah. Uh, if I buy uh, 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 what you call it, uh, a flashlight. That works with uh, a lithium battery. Fine, don't include batteries. I have my own. And we're going to need lithium for a while. And I recently 
heard that they could make the same technology with salt. Yeah. And if that's true, then, uh, well, uh, I still think we need to think about not throwing so much away. But that, that's a whole, whole different discussion, which could take literally a new podcast. Yep, and I don't think my bladder would be able to let me uh, keep going for another hour. So that's definitely, that's not it. And so no. let, let's do a little bit of closing thoughts here um, because your YouTube channel, although it seems like you last posted two years ago, uh, which was the, Correct. yeah, which was uh, hand, hand assembling the SP32 touchdown, um, there are actually a bunch of, really good videos that really are timeless, right? Stuff about, um, you know, stepper motors, uh, stuff about messing with PCBs, um, you know, even like the sunflower PCB and stuff like that, which are really pretty and, and work really well. Is there yes. any video you would like to point the audience towards? Is there any video you, you would like the, um, hmm. the listeners of this podcast to go take a look at specifically? My own or yes, from your, some, wait, my own. Your own. We, we can promote um, others after, but makers are horrible at promoting themselves. So I'd like you to promote yourself I first. Am. So, yeah, you got me there. I think a very timeless video is one that is also doing very well. So I don't need to promote that, but it's the one with the, uh, the haptic feedback, how those thi how those uh, things work. Okay, yeah, uh, that's I, a great I, video. I enjoyed it, mate. I enjoyed making it, and I realized how simple it is, and it could lead to well haptic feedback if you can't hear anything or see anything, but you can feel. I think haptic feedback. Uh, is a great answer to uh, those problems. It's essentially a little motor with a little offset tungsten weight, but all the magic happens in the software, right? When you, if you could program the correct vibrations, the, the correct sort of like a speed control for whatever situation, haptics can be absolutely incredible. Yeah. And in my video, I show you how simple it is. It is just turning it on or off. And then the magic happens in the software. Uh, but the start of it is just on off. It has two states. It's either on or off. You could make a, uh, a, a, a 10, because you have 10, 10 fingers, fingers normally. Uh, a, a ten finger pad, and talk to blind people just by, by some haptic feedback. Absolutely, I think uh, I I don't know if you if you have a a Steam Deck, but uh, Steam Deck is a handheld uh, gaming system, and the there are two touch pads sort of below the main controls that you use with your thumbs. And typically uh -huh. when I get a phone, I turn off haptics because I absolutely hate them. But on the Steam Deck, using the touchpad, it reminds me of like an old school iPod click wheel. It feels so good, the the haptics in those touchpads. Yeah. So yeah, I agree with you. Haptics are, are they can be great for sure. So that that would be my answer. Sounds go, good. Go and and not only will watch it because I, I don't need or really care about the watch time, watch the views. Of course, I am a YouTuber and I like views. But go and explore. For sure. And I'll that, encourage that, that, everyone listening to this uh, episode. The links will be in the show notes or the description below, depending on where you are watching or listening this from. I do want you to go check out Dustin's videos. Just, just watch a couple. I'm sure you'll be hooked. Um, the library is not that big, so you can get through it in uh, in a couple weeks. And um, definitely leave some comments because YouTubers uh, love to hear your feedback 
on on what we're working on. Yeah, now I can give you the floor though to promote some of the YouTubers uh, you watch if you want if you want to do that. Sure. I'm doing this by hat. I don't have my YouTube uh, subscriber list open. I really like uh, Adam Welsh. Welsh? Welsh, it's like, uh, isn't that like uh, a kind of thing you eat? Or is that a whelk? I don't know. Adam Welsh? Uh, Brian Locke? Uh, he's a great inspirer for me. And I think... In general, show some more love for the channels who who just start. Uh, I started, everyone starts with zero subscribers. If you have uh, 100 subscribers uh, or 99 and and you reach 100, that's that's an an amazing feeling. So I encourage people to show some love to the small channel. And not only the big ones. Yeah, and especially in our electronics niche, um, we are yes. in a very small niche, and there's there's essentially not enough electronics content. And so, if you want to encourage people to make more, you gotta watch, you gotta you gotta comment, and and you know, because the feedback is is phenomenal. Sometimes, yeah, for I don't know if it's the same for you, uh, but sometimes it feels a little weird like making videos into the void when there's no comments on on a on a video so um yeah if you want to encourage uh youtubers to keep youtubing you know you gotta you gotta comment on the videos you watch do that subscribe comment and like and not my videos but the the videos or the people i'm not making videos anymore in the void i'm past that luckily but there are a lot of people who are, and they keep going, and uh, they could could use some comments and some likes. And comments are even better. Well, well likes, of course, and subscriptions as well. But I really like uh, communicating with uh, my viewers. I try to respond to every comment, and uh, I welcome that for the smaller channels as well. Awesome. And on that note, we're going to end it here. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come onto the podcast. And I want to thank all the listeners for for hanging out with us. And um, yeah, we're going to catch you all on the next one. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Dan.